Okay. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited to do this. Uh, there's been sort of a lot in progress in the broadband forum when it comes to uh, USP and, uh, and the data models. And uh, so we thought it would be good to give everybody an update on what's coming um, by the end of the year so that uh, people can have a good vision of uh, how things are going to be going forward. Um, so uh, Daniel has also agreed, courteously agreed to join me today and uh, present uh, to you some uh, preview of what's to come and, uh, and I'll show you what we're going to cover in a minute. We, um, we are obviously running this via Zoom um, and we want to try to get through the slides pretty quickly so that we can have some good time for Q&A. If you do have questions, feel free to type them in at any time and uh, please type them into the Q&A box um, in, the, uh, in, in your Zoom control panel. The Q&A box really helps us manage the questions a lot easier. So please use that instead of the chat. If you're having audio issues or something, use the chat, but for, for, for questions, please use use Q&A. So without further ado, like I said, I am Jason Walls from uh, QA Cafe, and uh, I am the co-director of the Broadband User Services work area at the Broadband Forum, and that is the group that is responsible for uh, USP, the data models, TR69, and all of those great um, managed connected home things that you've become familiar with over time. And with me is Daniel Egger from Axeros. Um, he is the project stream leader for data modeling at the uh, at at the forum in the broadband user services group with me, um, he's a uh, principal uh, software engineer at Axeros. And if you ask him nicely and catch him early enough, uh, he will share a beer with you over Bavarian breakfast. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, so this is what we're going to cover today. Uh, I'm going to go um, uh, very first. I'm going to just refresh everybody on the parts of USP, just so you know what we're talking about. Um, and then I'll cover the, uh, the USP 1.2 changes. Um, and then Daniel will cover um, some of the data model updates, including bulk data, um, Wi-Fi, uh, the new stuff we're doing with, with managed Wi-Fi and uh, the, the collaborative work we're doing the rest of the industry on that. Um, what we're using for the new DOCSIS data models. Um, and then I'll talk a, a little bit about the certification program and the test plan and how um, that's gonna be going, going forward. And, how you can get involved uh, with the most fun you've ever had in standards and, uh, and help us out and add your input to the things that we're doing. Uh, this is gonna get a little technical in spots. Uh, and what I mean by that is just that there, there is some very granular things about USP that we know <laughs> very well, um, some very small changes, even though they're, they affect things rather significantly. Um, the, there are some things where you probably have to be familiar at least with having seen USB messages before to know what we're talking about. So I just wanted to throw that out there before uh, we get started. Uh, so just as a reminder of what makes up USP, um, it includes the specification itself, which is TR369. Um, that is going to be uh, version 1.2 that's coming out at the end of the year. Uh, it includes TR181, um, which is device two data model. That's gonna be device 2.15. Uh, by the end of the year. And then it also includes the certification program and the open source agent that follows, follows along with all those things. You can find information about all of that at usp.technology. And just a quick refresher on what USP looks like. Um, this is basically the ecosystem of the controllers and agents and how they all work together and where they can sit. Um, TR369 defines USP messages. Um, it defines USP agents and USP controllers and how they're supposed to behave. Um, and then it also has uh, sections on um, how to use um, the bulk data collection mechanism. And that's what Daniel is going to talk about. And then obviously it relies on the TR181 data model for the service elements and how they are defined. And then also this is the current USP 1.1 protocol stack just to put things in perspective. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I just wanted to show this so that uh, when I talk about the changes, you can uh, refer back to this slide uh, afterwards, you know, when we send stuff out or send the video out and you can compare uh, what we have here to what is going to be changing in the future. Okay, let's talk about USP up to now. Uh, we launched TR369 in 2018 after some after uh, many, many meetings and deliberations on how we were going to evolve TR69 into the next generation of uh, 
of devices and the next uh, order of magnitude of number of devices. And it has been going since then. We launched the open source agent through the broadband forum uh, in April, 2019. And then uh, in 2019, we, uh, in October, 2019, we launched USB 1.1. Um, and what was really great about that is we, it, it was based on a lot of feedback from the industry, especially around adding MQTT as a method of transport. Um, so we put that in 1.1. Um, and then we also expanded uh, the uh, Northbound REST API for, uh, for controllers so that you can integrate into a larger, larger cloud infrastructure. Um, and then added an entire section on uh, controlling IoT devices and IoT hubs um, using uh, device 2.13. Uh, we then launched the certification in June 2020. Uh, which is a self-certification program or self-testing certification program. So people can run the tests on their own, send them in and get their agents certified. Um, and then we've progressed since there. Uh, Amendment 14 or it's, it's device 2.14 came out uh, last year. And uh, the, uh, with the OBUSP agent is currently on its fourth version. The fifth version is going to be coming out soon. And we'll actually have a webinar about that uh, in, a, in a, a month or two. Um, yeah. And, just uh, just uh, another word, you, you maybe can see that most of the USP releases actually line up with the data model. And of course, the reason for that is that um, some of the features uh, of USP are actually defined in the data model. So uh, typically, you can expect whenever we release a new USP version, we also have to release a new data model version that goes with it in order to support the new features of, of the new protocol. Um, the only... Uh, let's say a separate version in here is the, the tier 181 uh, amendment to issue 14 because we, we didn't have enough uh, changes for uh, USP 1.2 at that point, but we had a lot of, uh, let's say independent or USP independent changes that we wanted to get out, which is yes. why we have the, the version in between. But usually yes, you right. can there, expect- there were, there were smaller yeah. versions of USP <laughs> in between there too. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but typically you can expect whenever we launch a new USP version, there will also be a new version of the data model because uh, some of the features actually need data model support. And where appropriate, we try to add a theory of operations or an annex somewhere to explain a little bit how that works. Okay, so let's talk about USP 1.2. Um, there's, I'm only going to talk in depth about a couple of these, um, but uh, some of the major things we did, uh, we just clarified uh, the way that uh, you're supposed to use TLS um, for end-to-end uh, -end, uh, security in, in USP. That includes- Yeah, and oh, exactly. And, and, and in general um, also, um, when, when USP first was designed, uh, TLS 1.3 wasn't officially released. Um, so, um, but we all, of course, I, let's say um, anticipated the release of TLS 1.3 and uh, incorporated it but um, in order to support uh, TLS 1.3 uh, later which changed quite a few things uh, in, in comparison to TLS 1.2 um, we basically updated also the, the standard to align more with the um, let's say other specifications that are involved with the, the TLS 1.3 so uh, we try to make sure that USP 1.2 is, is really compatible um, with TLS 1.2 and 1.3 and um, yeah, also the, the specification reflects all the, the special things or new features that you can do with TLS 1.3. Right. So use 1.3 if you can, of course. <laughs> um, we, in terms of the different transport mechanisms, um, like I said before, in 1.1, we have co-op, MQTT, Stomp, and WebSockets. Um, we have decided to deprecate co-op, and I'll go into why in a minute. Um, we've... Uh, become a little bit more um, efficient with the error messages that exist and um, especially at the MTP layer um, and also better defining them for the USP messages. Um, we clarified a little bit about how search expressions are supposed to work. Um, in 1.2, we're still working out some details about some additional things you can probably do with search expressions. Um, so you'll see that. Um, and then we've improved on a couple of things. So get supported DM is one of the most powerful features of USP. Um, and we've made a lot of improvements to that so that people can do device discovery even more easily than before. That's one of the things I'll go into, um, as well as just changing some of the uh, behavior of, of the basic messaging. I'll go into that. And then uh, really quick, we did add the ability to provide the controller's endpoint ID uh, when you're using DHCP discovery. So why deprecate co-app? I mean, it was in there the whole time. 
many people have probably heard my speech about how we use different MTPs for different use cases, and that's why we define them that way. Um, it turns out that when in our effort to remain MTP, MT message transfer protocol agnostic, transport agnostic, um, it made CoAP a little bit complex when we put it in USP, um, such that it really only makes sense to use it in a local network where it's cr not crossing any network boundaries. Um, and we've kind of found that most of the use, same use cases can just be met by using WebSockets. So we're going to deprecate that in USP 1.2. And is there anything else you wanted to say about why, why we did that? <laughs> uh, well, as, as it turns out, you know, every browser and um, every, you know, mobile environment already supports WebSockets for, for other reasons. So it's, it's actually very uh, common to, to find implementations everywhere. So uh, also, Directing people into the direction of, of WebSockets makes a lot of sense in terms of ensuring that, uh, yeah, great, uh, the greatest possible um, compatibility is, is achieved. Um, so that's, that's the main reason why uh, Corp was deprecated, to not distract people from uh, things that maybe don't work that great um, towards the things that really everyone should be supporting nowadays. Right. Um, okay, let's talk about get supported data model. Um, this is a message in the user services platform that allows a controller to query an agent and have the agent respond with its supported data model. That is the objects, parameters, commands, and events that it supports, even if there happens to be no particular instances of those objects uh, at the time. Um, like I said, it's one of the most useful features of USP. Um, it, it's leaps and bounds, uh, you know, more efficient than using get parameter names over and over and down the tree in tier 69, like we used to have to do. Um, and uh, so we wanted to expand on that and make it a little bit more useful to people. Um, so based on feedback, uh, we added the ability to learn the data type of parameters. Um, for, for parameters specifically, you get your the data type. You also get whether or not it's uh, allowed to be the subject of a value change event. Um, and for operations, we tell you whether it is a synchronous or asynchronous operation. Um, and then the other really cool thing that we're doing, and this is really based on the work that we have been doing with, uh, with, with getting USP to a, a point where it can better support uh, independent pieces of software that are being loaded on gateways um, or proxy devices, things that are not, that are, can still be managed, but they're not managed directly by a USP, but the agent sort of brings them up into its data model and presents them to the controller, is the ability to use get supported data model on an object instance. And what that means is normally when you do get supported data model, you can you, you ask for what the, what the agent supports and it reports back to you, it's supported data model. It doesn't give you what instances currently exist. But if you happen to know um, of a particular instance that does exist, you can use, you can query get supported, get supported data model on just that instance. And so if it happens to be a little different than what it might be, um, get supported data model will report to you the supported parameters, uh, objects, commands, and events um, that that instance supports specifically. Yeah. And like I said, that's, that's, that's yeah, yeah, that's that that's right. So at, at the moment we don't really support divergent data models as as we call them, um, so that different objects can have uh, different uh, kind of information in them. Um, but uh, as as Jason said, we are working on getting support for. Um, you know, dynamic services that can basically register parts of the data model uh, within the supported data model tree. And for that, you actually need to have the ability to query directly on object instances to see what's um, yeah, in there and, and what, what kind of additional data model a particular service provided. I, I would also um, elaborate a little bit uh, more on, on two points that we have in here. So one of the reasons why we want to have the, the data type information in here is that um, by using this binary encoding protobuf, we are actually giving up all type information. So if, if you're coming from tier 69, you might know that um, basically the, the protocol will automatically give you the, the type information uh, with each value that, that you're receiving. But that doesn't exist in, in protobuf anymore. 
And of course, it's useful for the controller to know what kind of data um, the, the controller will be getting back from the device in, in case they, they ask for some parameter value. So that's that's one thing why we uh, wanted to have the data type in there. So to make the, the get supported DM more useful and also to add the, the missing type information um, that we don't have in, in protobuf. And the second thing is the um, value change behavior. As you may know, if, if you've looked at the data model reports, there is some um, coming from tier 69, some information in there, which of the parameters support active notification or do not support active notification. And uh, since in um, USP, the, the notifications are back, uh, actually all evaluated on, on the fly. So you don't set a flag like in tier 69, and then you will get the, the reports back. And uh, setting that particular flag will directly error if um, value change uh, notifications cannot be supported on that type. Um, you don't have that in, in USP. So you generate your subscriptions, you subscribe to value changes, um, but the, the subscriptions are evaluated on the fly. So you don't get any, any result back telling you that you actually won't receive any value change notifications. So for that particular reason, we added the possibility to actually um, see whether the device will uh, try to, to honor the the, the value change request, or um, it will basically just ignore um, that particular parameter and not give you any, any value changes. And similar for the operation type, um, which applies to, to the commands, um, it, um, the, the asynchronous commands that we have in, in USP behave a little bit differently from the synchronous commands that we have. Again, this is a feature that's a part of the data model which is why it makes sense to have it in the get supported data model um, call. Um, but since the, the behavior is slightly different, so in, in order to receive information about uh, the status of an ongoing asynchronous operation, you ha have to create a subscription um, for that kind of information. And in order to know that you have to do that, um, it's very useful to have this information in the get supported uh, data model call. Right. And as always, if you don't care about knowing all that information, there are flags in get supported DM to turn the, the verbosity down for each of those things. <laughs> yep. Uh, okay, let's talk about the uh, improvements we made to I, I say I say improving message flexibility, that's really just so that um, a controller doesn't have to worry about getting errors for things that you know, when it's trying to do something, uh, you know, an error is something that it has to go and check about. Um, we wanted to make it so there's a little bit more flexible for when you're trying to do something and that what you wanted really did happen uh, and you don't really care about uh, the rest of it. And so what that is, is when when things like delete, so so a path is valid, um, a path that is valid, meaning that it isn't, you know, it isn't garbage. It is something that's in the supported data model, um, but it doesn't match any objects. Um, it's still considered a success for um, for a couple of, of messages. So, for example, in in delete, um, the state that you want is that the instance you're trying to delete doesn't exist anymore. So, what we did is change it so that if you try to delete something that actually is wrong, like invalid, you know, this this object isn't a real object, um, you'll get an error. Um, but if you try to delete something that is correct but just doesn't exist, um, messages like delete and I, I, we. We did this to get to, but it's a little bit different. Um, we'll return to you a successful operation, but with nothing in it. Um, and that makes it really easy for the controller if it's trying to do many, many things at once that none of it's gonna get bumped out by doing, uh, you know, having an error on one thing. Um, and then a couple of clarifications on the way the ad message works now. Um, we have this concept of required parameters uh, for set and for add. Um, and so the, the idea there is that if the controller marks something as required, then and it can't be set for whatever reason, then that's you know that causes the object creation to fail. Um, unique keys are always considered required. That doesn't mean that the controller has to provide them. It just means that they are required parameters. So if the controller does not provide them, the agent has to provide values to those keys and return them. Um, and uh, so we and we fix them some of the language in add to such that. You can use unique key addressing. Um, before it was kind of ambiguous because we said that you couldn't use a search path, but USP doesn't really define the difference between unique key addressing 
and using a search path. And so there's a little bit of a clarification in that requirement such that you can use unique key addressing when you're using the add request. It just has to only match one object, which it probably will because you're using the unique key. <laughs> Uh, all right. Lastly, before I turn things over entirely to Daniel to talk about bulk data collection is some changes to get response. Um, so when you make a request uh, using get on an object path, you might know them from tier 69 as a partial path, meaning you just put in a path to, to an object and you want to know everything else below it. Um, you're supposed to return uh, all the parameters of that object and all of the, their sub-objects sub and all of those parameters underneath. Um, the way we had it doing right now, still using relative paths. So, you know, you have this resolved path and then everything below it is supposed to be relative to this resolved path. Um, but there was some ambiguity as to whether you're supposed to do it this way um, or to just uh, have one resolved path followed by everything underneath, including all of this sub objects and all of their parameters. It turns out that there is there is a more efficient way to do this, but it depends on exactly the kind of get that you're making and where, you know, what object you're requesting and how high up it is in the path, right? Um, and it depends, but for the most part, it is actually a little bit more efficient such that each sub object will now resolve to its own resolved path element in the message um, and then have its parameters as, you know, just single key value pairs underneath it. Um, and then repeat that all the way down the tree until you get to the bottom. It's right. like we, and yeah. it, it also makes it less um, ambiguous. Sorry about ruining your joke, <laughs> but it also <laughs> no, makes it less. <laughs> it, it also makes it less ambiguous uh, when it comes to uh, doing different queries. So the, the data that you will get now is always the same, regardless of how you actually queried for the data. And before it was like, if you query in this way, you will get the data in this particular format. And if you request it in a different way, you will get it in a different uh, format. So you would have to do some normalization and actually to actually get to the to the same path at at the end so right um, and i think also we, have... we also had some discussion about for backwards compatibility purposes a controller should expect that it might receive this information either this way or the old way um, yes. but it shouldn't be a problem because you're really just appending the path to the resolved path and it you know should just work <laughs> uh but, there's, there's an old philosophy joke about it being turtles all the way down. So all the way down to the bottom of the tree. Yeah, it was just getting nested and nested and nested and nested. <laughs> okay, Daniel, let's let's switch over and talk about bulk data collection. Yep. Uh, you, you're still going to present or do you want me to no, take go ahead. over? Yeah, go ahead and take it. Yeah. Okay. Um, just need to do a switch around then. Um, if I could find my Zoom, uh, maybe maybe you go yeah, on on presenting because uh, yeah, Zoom right. is acting up again. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So um, we have supported bulk data collection um, in in a very similar way that we did for for tier sixty nine. So it has been part of the tier sixty nine standard for quite a bit, and it was basically taken as is from tier sixty nine and just adapted a little bit in order to um to make it more suitable for for usp because some some of the things of of course has have changed and um yeah we wanted to make it more useful for that so um we already had this nxa in tier 69 which was adapted from from tier 69 uh, specification which um support some information on how to do the um, out of band bike data collection using the, the HTTPS uh, command. So just as a quick refresher, basically you set up um, a bike data collection profile and that bike data collection profile um, will contain information about what needs to be collected from the device. And you basically set up a, a schedule and um, whenever that schedule is, is executed, basically the device will collect the information and then it will open an HTTPS connection or it will use a different protocol. It depends on whether you're looking at tier 69 or USP, but it will basically send you a report in a, in a specific format. So there are also different choices. You can use JSON or you can use something like CVS. 
and the device will basically open up a, a HTTP connection and push a file that contains all the information that should be included as per the, the bike data profile. And in USP, we actually support the same mechanism as in, in tier 69. So you can use um, the HTTPS command, but in um, the device 213, so after uh, the original USP standard was released, we, we added the ability to use uh, what is called uh, in-band notification. So there's a special um, event as you might know by now, um, USP uses events and commands that are defined in the data model um, to specify the, the capabilities of, of a device. And in this particular case, we added this in-band mechanism uh, using the, the push event, and that allows you to use USP directly as the transfer channel for the, the bike data. Um, so that that's very nice because you get rid of the, the extra channel and you don't need to, to reconcile the, the data that you're getting using two different mechanisms um, um, Yeah, on, on the server side. You can simply use the same uh, connection that is already established because USP is always on. So you already have the channel established and you can just uh, get the data the, the same way, which is very efficient and provides a lot of uh, benefits. Um, so what we did change here was um, that we actually also specified how that mechanism works. So um, if, if you could go to the next page. Um, so what we did do is basically rewrite that particular, uh, particular NXA that is describing the, the bike data mechanism in USP 1.2 um, to cover the, the USP specific details. So we explain how it works that you can use either the, the HTTPS mechanisms that people are used to from tier 69, but it also explains how the in-band mechanism works. And we also improve the, the explanation of the concept a little bit. So some of the things in the, in the data model were not quite clear on, on how the, the in-band notifications work. Um, so we, we added some explanation and improved um, on, on that particular concept. And now there's also this new section about how to use this uh, USP event notification so um, that you can actually use the, the in-band data transmission. And uh, we also noticed that there were a couple of requirements which were not properly labeled according to, to our standards. And so we turned them in, into labeled ones. So there are now two official uh, new requirements in the USP standard. Uh, describing how it actually works and yeah, what, what the requirements are uh, for, for using this particular mechanism. So this is nothing new, it was just uh, clarified basically. Um, so as, as you can see, um, we also had some, some changes in the uh, data model in order to support these new capabilities. So we expanded that. Um, and one of the main changes that we had here is there is a controller parameter and this particular controller parameter will be automatically populated with the controller that created the object. Um, we detected a few issues with the way the, the mechanism was previously um, described in that um, there were no uh, use of, of the permissions that we have in, in USP. Um, so in, in USP, we have this permission system which allows you to control in a very fine-grained manner um, which controller is support to have access to which data. And the way that the bike data collection was described previously basically would allow anyone to um, subscribe to this particular push um, notification, whether it was uh, the data was meant for them or not. And whenever the, the um, bike data collection was executed and the bike data um, report was created, um, Basically, any, any, any controller could receive that particular bike data report, regardless of whether the controller is supposed to have access to the information or not. So one change that we did is that we changed this. So only the uh, creator of the particular profile can actually reach the report. So only if, if multiple controllers want to um, receive the same information, they will have to create the individual profiles. And uh, again, it will be automatically populated and the permissions that are used to fetch the data from the data model on the device are the ones um, from the controller who created that particular bike data profile, which solves that particular, you know, getting access to data, you shouldn't have access to problem. 
Um, and in addition to that, to make it uh, more useful and to allow the collection of devices uh, at, at any point in time, rather than on, on the fixed schedule that you have set up, we also added a new command, uh, which is called force collection, which allows you to do an impromptu collection of, of the data. So you basically just call it and the profile will be um, created and uh, sorry, not the profile, the report will be created and sent out immediately uh, using the specified mechanism. So that also works for uh, HTTPS, of course, but um, this is mainly useful for the in-band data collection. Next slide. Um, another big thing that we added is uh, support for, for DOCSIS. Um, so as we've done for a couple of, of other um, standards, we basically mirroring the, the management capabilities um, of those other uh, management protocols. So um, as, as you might know, DOCSIS is uh, heavily uh, based on um, using DHCP and SNMP um, for, for data collection, but in order to make it more useful for um, USP to also get access to the, the data, um, we added the support for the, the data model in, inside um, yeah, our, our regular data model. So basically what we are doing is we are mirroring the um, DOCSIS SNMP MIP, which is the specification of parameters in SNMP, um, and put it into tier 181. So now we have a new um, object called um, device doxes. It used to be called device.cable. I think it's still called device.cable, but we already said we would uh, rename that uh, to be more specific and to be more clear what, what this is about. And it's mostly read only. So we have a little bit of write only um, parameters in there, but most of them are read only um, since that is what we've been doing with all the other proto uh, protocol um, or management interfaces as well. So the idea here really is we are just mirroring the data and we are not providing any management capability outside of the usual management protocols which are used for um, these technologies. Um, we have DOCSIS 3.0 and 3.1 support, which is the latest um, release, and we are prepared to also mirror any uh, follow-up standards as they come along. And we also put in all the, the usual references. So if, if you have a look at the, at the new data model report, you can actually see that we are referencing the SNMP MIP in there. So um, if you want to overlay the data or if you want to see what um, SNMP um, parameter, this, uh, a certain parameter in the data model corresponds to, then you can easily look it up uh, because it's all uh, cross-referenced. Next slide. Um, another big topic uh, that we did is uh, alignment with uh, the, the upstream uh, Wi-Fi standards. So there are a number of... Um, um, let's say Wi-Fi initiatives, which are also driven by operators and, and vendors, um, because as you know, Wi-Fi is evolving rather quickly and also the, the capabilities are evolving rather quickly with, you know, multi-access point, uh, Wi-Fi mesh, uh, data element standards. So um, we had a big uh, discussion round with a lot of, of vendors and, and operators to align with those um, upstream standards. So specifically, we have added support for um, data elements uh, release two. So that there was a little bit of, let's say, uh, fiddling to get all the, the timelines coordinated with those um, upstream versions. Um, so they, they basically uh, created a, a release um, that we could reference um, and that's, that's what we did. So we added all the support for the data elements release too. And that's now fully aligned. We also added some additional commands which turned out to be quite useful to allow for, for neighborhood scans. So if you want to do a Wi-Fi management system, this allows you to um, actually um, actively start the scan of, of the neighborhood rather than waiting for the device to do it yourself, uh, to do it itself. And uh, you just fetch the data. So we have now explicit, um, let's say, trigger actions for that. We also added support for uh, the association and, and disassociation and also the transition of um, Wi-Fi stations. So um, your typical Wi-Fi clients to a different Wi-Fi access point. Um, 
that's also sometimes very useful. And we also added support for um, allowing to trigger the um, WPS uh, push button uh, configuration, which allows you to basically uh, simulate a, a push of the, the physical button that you have on your Wi-Fi access point in order to associate a Wi-Fi station with the, the access point. Yeah, and get it automatically set up, including encryption and everything. Uh, next slide. Um, so we, of of course, that's that's not all that that we did. We had a lot of um, other data model changes um, that would be, you know, too too much to to mention them here all all in detail. But there's uh, the Spable routing protocol, and we now have full support for uh, configuration and and monitoring of that particular protocol. Um, we also added support for USP controller configuration from tier 69. So if you have a device that's capable of uh, handling both tier 69 and USP, uh, we now have officially added the capability of uh, setting up a USP controller from tier 69. So you can basically migrate from tier 69 to USP or just uh, you know implement some use cases using USP while still continuing to use tier 69 for provisioning. Um, we also added the other way around the ability that if you have uh, set up um, USP in, in that way or in, in a different way, I mean, there are many different options that you have in order to set up USP, but um, if, if you have such a device that has both capabilities and you want to turn off tier 69 because everything has been migrated from uh, to, to USP, then you can actually do that as well now. Um, we also have uh, largely improved the, the um, local user management capabilities in the data model. So we now have added uh, support for um, managing groups on the device. So groups are basically, you know, if, if you have multiple accounts, you can group them into different, um, yeah, <laughs> groups that uh, have different uh, capabilities or access to different parts on, on the device. So. Those can be defined now, which of course aligns with the capabilities of the often used uh, Linux uh, system underneath. Um, you can also assign roles. Roles is, is a, a similar concept, which allows you to define the, the capabilities of a particular um, user, and then you can assign them to groups or um, users. Um, and we also defined the capability of setting up uh, shells. So if, if you want to give some user access to the device, uh, in, in a certain way, you can now um, introspect at least um, what kind of shell the, the user will be getting when they log into to the device locally. Um, some of the, the bike data um, changes that I mentioned, so BDC is, is bike data collection. Some of the, the bike da data collection changes uh, were actually mirrored into other um, objects. So for instance, we have the threshold mechanism, which allows you to um, uh, define thresholds um, based on, on value changes of, of parameter. And if those thresholds are triggered, it would basically create an event saying, you know, this threshold was, uh, yeah, triggered basically. And we aligned this with the changes that I explained earlier um, about having the, the controller object in there. So only the, um, uh, on, uh, each controller can only create those uh, threshold objects for itself and the permissions that those thresholds will use are the ones of the controller who created it and only the uh, controller who created a threshold object can actually um, receive the, the event in case the, the threshold uh, triggers. And of course, we have a ton of, uh, you know, smaller additions and, and corrections and something that we don't explicitly use uh, or, or mentioned in, in here is um, one of the big changes that we are making is we are trying to make the whole um, standard documents uh, far more accessible. So a lot of changes have been done un under the hood to uh, make sure that everything is, is properly uh, linked cross reference so we we added a lot of um, you know references in into other standards made sure that all the the links are uh, correct and and verified we made sure that we can automatically verify that all the examples that we have in the usp specification are now validated um, some more documents have been turned into markdown standard which also allows us to make uh, 
the, the changes that we need to do much easier than using uh, the, the word processor that we have used uh, previously, like Word. Um, and we also added a lot of, of usability changes so that the generated output will look much nicer and will make much more sense and in, in some cases will be much more accessible, which is a huge benefit. Okay, Jason, back to you. All right. Uh, I did want to talk a little bit about um, certification. Um, so the BBF.369 certification has been available for a while. Um, like I said, it is, uh, it's done by self-testing. Uh, so you test with the approved test tool and you test and retest at your convenience. And then you um, submit those results to an approved lab who double checks it and then does the um, certification. So we're going to be releasing TP469, which is the test plan. Um, alongside the other releases uh, that are mentioned here. And I already saw, I think, at least one question about that that I'll get to. Um, and then, uh, so the, the, the only thing you really need to know going forward is that the certification is done according, so your certification uh, is applied to a particular version of the test plan um, and also particularly the firmware version of the, uh, of the thing that you're getting uh, certified. So when doing the certification right now is totally fine. And uh, you know when those 1.1 changes come out, if you have things that are later going up against the test cases that are now defined in 1.1, um, you know you you can get certification that way, and it will say that it's against 1.1. 1, 1 .1. And just as a reminder, there is what we call a, a feature IDs in the test plan, and that defines the tests that you have to run based on what your agent supports. Um, it's it it gets very granular. It's you know. Because sometimes what we ran into with the um, with the BBF.069 certification is you'd have some uh, some devices that were trying to get certified that didn't have any addable writable objects, and so how could you verify like you know add object? You can't because there aren't any to do it on, right? Uh, so this time we tried to break it down a little bit more so that any kind of agent can get certified. But however, it's extremely important that you do run all of the test cases that you do support. Um, otherwise, you will end up having uh, pretty severe interoperability problems out in the field. Um, but definitely ask us uh, for more information about that. Uh, we can give you kind of a timeline of what things are going to change when and uh, yeah, and what things are going into 1.1. Yep. All right. Um, above all, please get involved. Um, if there's anything that I dislike more, it's vendor extensions. No, I'm just kidding. Vendor extensions are totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do have something that you feel like should be added to the data model or something that you want to change about USP, please, uh, BBF members can contribute at any time. Uh, we use JIRA for our issue tracking uh, and our contribution system, and we have a weekly call schedule. Speaking of that weekly call schedule, I saw that somebody was asking about the uh, status of the collaboration between Purple and BBF on microservices. We have a bi-weekly call about that uh, on Tuesdays, and I think the next one is not this week, but next week, right, Daniel, I think? The, not this um, coming Tuesday, but the Tuesday. Yeah. After. yeah. <laughs> uh, so please, if, if you're a Broadband Forum member, um, sign up for those calls and you'll be able to track the progress of that and contribute to it as well. Um, again, you can find everything about USP at usp.technology um, and you can find the open source agent on the Broadband Forum's uh, GitHub account. With that, if, I would if, like to. If, oh, yeah, yeah if, if if you were Steve Jobs, you would now say, uh, and one last thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, in, in, in order to, to uh, you know, we discussed a lot of things in, in this particular session, and um, we definitely want to have more people have a look at what's uh, coming up before it's, you know, released and, and final and, and set in stone and uh, will require an, an update to the specification to be uh, changed again. Um, so we are working on getting draft releases of the USP and the TR 181 out um, as, as soon as possible. I, I don't think we have a definitive timeline on, on that yet, but it should, it should be in a couple of weeks, I think. Yes. So we, we are going to, to publish draft versions of the, the upcoming standards in order for people to have a look what's coming and um, if they want, they can get involved um, earlier. And of course, for, for members that 
is very easy to get involved, as we had uh, just said. And if you're not a member, that's the perfect chance to become one. Right. So back to okay. questions. Yeah, we have some good ones. Um, I, ho uh, I, I hope I answered the question about the USB purple collaboration. Um, yeah. Daniel, did, why don't you ta take a look at those and if there's one you want to pick up, but I want yeah, to have a question I've, about I've, the, the, the example, the protobuf example standardization. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have never really intended those to be normative, but we realize that that does affect a lot of people. Um, so in, in, um, TR, in, in TP469 and TR369, uh, we are going to try to not necessarily standardize, but at least normalize all those examples so they're following the same format. So that'll make a little bit more sense. <laughs> yeah. So I, I wanted to pick up the, the question here, does the deprecation of core will have any backward compatibility issues? Um, no, it won't have. So um, you're still free to use the, the co-op MTP um, if, if you can use it. So um, putting a deprecation marker on it just means it's not uh, supposed to be used for new implementations. But if you already have an implementation, you can still use it. And other than that, it doesn't affect any of the other parts of, of the protocol. It's yet another MTP, I, I would say. Right. I, I think initially we had always said that you should only feel feel like you have to implement those MTPs that are fit for the use case of the agent that you're deploying. Yep. Um, uh, okay, that's that's a long question. Um, you, you already <laughs> answered the, the question from Luis, right, about the, the yes. case differences between so. the examples. I, I hope that that was satisfactory. So, so yeah. we are going to try to, like I said, we're going to try to normalize the uh, the protobuf examples. So yes, that's the same. That's, that's one of the changes that I just mentioned. Um, we have settled um, to use the, um, the proto text um, encoding. So that's a semi official encoding that's uh, proposed by, by Google. So the, the creators of, of protobuf um, that yeah, kind of um, en encodes what you would uh, see in, in binary, but in, in a text form. And we kind of have followed the, the proto text um, standard in the past. So in the, in the current versions of the USP specification, but unfortunately um, it was not enforced. So um, let's say a, a few things got out of hand and uh, are not adhering to the in, inofficial um, proto text um, standard definition. So what we did in the latest version is we improved our tooling um, to actually verify um, all those changes against the, the protobuf schema. And um, we have fixed all the, the examples to adhere to the uh, proto text uh, format for, for now. But we are already discussing uh, whether we want to change to a different format because uh, proto text is a little bit ambiguous in, in a few things and uh, not the, the most easiest and, and most common one to, to write and, and read. Um, so th there was just a quick question about, you know, USP versus some of the proprietary things that are out there. Um, you know, we don't necessarily have a crystal ball about what things are going to be at a certain point. There is an Omdia survey, however, uh, that Broadband Forum commissioned, uh, that was very, um, it, it had a very, very broad audience from multiple regions, uh, and multiple types of, uh, service providers, um, in, in that survey, which I encourage everyone to look at, um, Actually, Rhonda, if you're on and you have a link to the, uh, the results of that survey, that would be a great thing to post into chat. Um, I'm working on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, uh, that, that was one very sobering piece of information was that was something like 75% of providers said that they planned on deploying USP in some form or another in the next year or two. Um, so I would, I would definitely take that information as, as some indication of where things are going. <laughs> So I would like to take the next one, which is about uh, how to actually use the abilities of, of USP and uh, how you can use make use of, of the tremendous uh, amount of, of collected data and whether there's anything about um, AI or ML tools to um, use those, those data. 
Um, so actually, the, the the broadband forum does not really um, make use or or describe how to use it. There are a few, uh, let's say, um, un unrelated or partially related projects like the the QED uh, project stream, which tries to make sense of the, of the data and um, yeah, also defines how how to use it in in a more useful manner, so that you are not just randomly collect data and and try to make sense out of it, but uh, yeah, to to basically define the, the steps and to to give a framework on on how to to use this data most efficiently and which data to collect. Um, so yeah, I, I would recommend you check with those particular groups. Um, so especially the the TR four seventy one um, standard that uh, might give you some insight on what you can do. Um, but yeah, the broadband forum doesn't really care about uh, how you do it. So <laughs> um, related to the other question, whether um, we as Axeros have any products, um, yes, we do. Um, and I would uh, recommend you uh, connect with our people in, in order to figure out what we, what we can do in, in order to, to solve those problems. All right. Is there another one you would like to grab, Daniel? I'm, I'm typing an answer to, to one of them right now. Um, okay. Actually, I can, uh, I'll answer that live. Okay. So the question is, it's, will, will TP469 uh, be changed in accordance with the upgrades mentioned today? As you probably expect, there's a bit of a lag uh, between the, um, the, the specification and the test plan only because there has to be a period of time in which we validate, validate it against real implementations <laughs> um, to make sure that the test cases operate that the way they're supposed to. Um, there are there will be some of these changes in version 1.1 of TP469, um, mostly around the way that messages are supposed to operate and the thick because most of that information came to us through clarifications of doing that validation process. They were like, oh, this is unclear in the standard what should we actually be doing here? And then we found out what was actually supposed to be true. That's going to be an update of 1.2, but we're also going to put that in the test plan in 1.1 because it doesn't make sense to not do that, right? Um, the thing to look for in future versions of 469 um, after that fact, like when we, we want we want to get them eventually to align so that one that version 1.2 of 469 and version 1.2 of USB are the same. Um, and that involves adding uh, test cases for new functionality. That is in one that it was even in 1.1. Um, and you know, just basic test cases that are, you know, you can you can still run the test plan as it is now. It's just there's some test cases that just aren't in there for some new functionality, but you can still run everything else. Uh, MQTT um, test cases are, are a good example of that, right? So you can run the certification tests over MQTT just fine. And you know, you'll pass, you know, you'll be able to pass the majority of them. There are just no specific MQTT test cases yet, but you can look for that in version 1.2 of 469. That was yes. easier than typing. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, so we also had a question, what's new in, in the service data models, uh, specifically VoIP? Um, actually, we, we don't have many changes in the service data models. I, I don't think we have any that would warrant a, a new release. Uh, unfortunately, we, we didn't have a lot of, of contributions. As you might know, Broadband Forum is, is entirely contribution driven. So uh, unless people come in and, you know, report problems and uh, try to get new things standardized, uh, nothing is going to happen. So if you are interested in having additional support for, for voice over IP, I would highly recommend that um, you join our group and, you know, put the things that you would like to see supported uh, on, onto the table and we can certainly discuss them. Um, there's another question on whether device.docsys is only going to support whatever whatever cable labs is supporting and the answer is yes. So as I mentioned, we are just mirroring what uh, the, the standards put out by cable labs um, define. Um, in order to give more visibility from the, the USP perspective. So if, if you happen to have a device that has USP support, you can also get the same information you would be able to get over SNMP, but we are not um, defining anything on top of that or trying to interfere with uh, whatever Cable Labs is, is doing. So yes, it's just uh, putting in the information that Cable Labs uh, defines and, and supports. 
So I, I clicked off on the, the, we had a couple of questions about RDKB. So I think we'll probably answer them together. Um, there is collaboration um, on adding USP to RDKB. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head the official status of that because I do know, definitely know that it's an ongoing thing and we're, it's basically incorporating the uh, open source agent into RDKB. Um, Daniel, I don't know if you have any more information about that, but it, it is definitely a thing. <laughs> yeah, so that, that work is, is ongoing, but uh, I, I guess the, the typical answer, answer would be, uh, yeah, that there might be some people involved with RDKB and Broadband Forum that know more about the, the current status, but from the Broadband Forum perspective, this is just one implementation of many, so um, <laughs> yeah. An important implementation. Uh, ooh. Probably, yeah. <laughs> this is a this is a good one. I like this one. Uh, okay. how, d how does get supported DM? How is it useful for a vendor specific data model? That is actually the best thing about get supported data model <laughs> is that uh, you know rather than having to rely on uh, emailing spreadsheets back and forth with you know this is what you're supposed to implement and that sort of thing, get supported DM is entirely made. Uh, to be able to report vendor uh, vendor extensions uh, in the supported data model, and they will they should anyway be built to uh, to reply with the same information that it would reply about any of the standard data models. Yep. So I have another a short one about um, the data model. So the question is, are you looking into adding DNS over TLS support in the data model? I'm not entirely sure what exactly you would like to see supported, but I would highly recommend you get in touch with us. And if there's a use case for uh, to add something that isn't there yet, uh, we'd be more than, than happy to uh, you know take it in as, as a future addition to the data model. All right. Uh, there, there was a question about the northbound API uh, that has not changed. Yeah, <laughs> that was a quick one. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't see anything. And of course, the the usual question, uh, you know, will the uh, Will these slides uh, be available? Yes. If you have, if you agreed to be contacted in the future by the broadband forum and click yes on that, uh, then we uh, can send you the slides in the in the video after the fact. As always. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, if you have any further questions, by all means, uh, you can you can contact the broadband forum directly. Um, on their website or through info at uh, broadband-forum.org. Broadband um, you can, if you're a member, please, by all means, sign up for the, um, the broadband user services email list. Um, that's where you'll get invites to, the, to uh, our, our call schedule. Um, and also, uh, the, you can get access to the, um, the USP uh, and data model Slack channels where you can ask uh, questions about uh, about USP and, and, and the data models directly and, and we'll reply to you directly over those things. And right. of course, we would be happy to have you in our calls and to participate in, in the discussion. Yes, always, always. We, we are very welcoming and as I say repeatedly, <laughs> it is the most fun you'll ever have in standards. Um, okay, well, thank you everybody. And uh, like I said, please look forward to um, some of our future webinars, I think we're going to do one uh, in a couple of weeks or, or a month or two on um, on the next version of OB USB agent and and uh, what was just in four and what's coming in five and having that all line up. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, thank you for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of your evenings or the rest of your days. Bye. <laughs>